How do you do a PhD in maths? Actually, you did a master's in maths, then a PhD in maths. And I think that's actually one thing that I really love about Barcelona is if you look at the people who live in Barcelona, they know how to like. Oh. I'll ask you a question about maths. What is this uh, USA and Canada joke going on? How did you end up in Barcelona? <laughs> Welcome to a podcast session on maths. What do you want to know about maths? What type of math I do? What, like, I think about math? Or why I decided to, like, study it? I'll ask you a question about maths. Do you think it's invented or discovered? My mind is shaking right now. <laughs> math is... But if it's discovered, that means it was invented once, right? I mean, no, not necessarily. Like, when we discover, like bones or we discover something about the world yeah. it doesn't mean it was invented it means okay. it's part of nature part of it's nature like, yeah yeah like okay. is, it, is it man-made or is it like ah uh, i think if you go very deep into it like into the root i feel it is uh, discovered yeah i feel it's discovered it's not invented but i think slowly with progression of of maths i think it's becoming very inventive yeah Ish. Yes. Like, like when you relate to to theorems, for example, yeah. you're kind of inventing new theories. But are you inventing new theorems or are you discovering them? Like, you can't just create a new theorem because it has to. It has live to be discovered by the rules that are really ah, set up. True, but then who makes those rules? It's 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 a it's a discovery of rules, but it's also an invention, right? Both. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess that's where it gets kind of interesting. Huh. So, I would say it's more discovered than not, because you can't, yeah, you can't just make stuff up. It has to, so essentially, kind of, it's like, there are some rules, like some axioms that are at the very basis of mathematics. And, like, they're the most simple things that we use to describe a world. Like, A plus B adds up to A and B, like... Just stuff like that. So you can break it down to these small axioms and then everything is kind of built off from these axioms and built up into everything else from these kind of rules. And I would say that these rules are kind of set by nature. So they're kind of you, they're kind of like the laws of our nature and the laws of like kind of reality force it kind of upon us. Like you can't, if you cannot take two sheets and three sheeps, and have four sheeps. No. You take two sheeps, and you have three sheeps, you have five sheeps. Right? And these rules, and this is like kind of, and then these kind of set the basis in the group, and there's these far, like you go down to these axioms, and then from that, everything kind of gets built upon. And you can newly define stuff, but once you define something, you can't break the rules necessarily of mathematics. Mm. So this is what you call discovery, yeah. like three plus two, like the three sheeps and two sheeps, because it's technically in front of you. I mean, that's a rule. I guess the discovery but, would be more like when you first like the fact that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, mm. like Pythagoras and Pythagorean's rule. Mm. Nobody came up with that. Yeah. Right? And yeah. Nobody, nobody came just up. decided that yeah. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Yeah. People discovered it. And another reason yeah. why I would say it's discovered is because, like, these things were discovered in different parts of the world, in different times, in different, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, the basic rules of math have always been kind of agreed upon, for the most part, upon society. Okay. But societies have had different ways of representing math. Like? Like, numeric systems, stuff like that, like the way you count... Like, the number zero was an invent... Like, India came up with the number zero. So, yeah. <laughs> but that came up, like, thousands of years before... I mean, yeah. like, long after, like, what Europeans had for math. And then other stuff in math, like, for the longest time, people thought math was only, like, the integers. Like... Wait, what is integers? Like, for? Integers are, like, one, two, ah, three, yeah. like, whole numbers, ah. you know? Whole numbers, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it went... Yeah, but then, like, obviously there's more. But there was a time where people were, like arguing over the basis of math if you could have stuff that weren't integers or not there's another thing with the whole infinity people didn't believe infinity was a number and wasn't part of math and people tried to 
not do anything with infinity uh, and like stuff like that you know you know what my math sir proved us yeah. in 10th grade this was in 2014 yeah yeah on the chalkboard he proved us 1 is equal to 2 is that possible or not cuz he did it in front of like 33 people in class and we were like whoa no it's it's no it's not 1 is not equal to 2 He, 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 he probably did. I think I've seen stuff like this. He probably did some like sleight of hand type of trick. What, what Not that? sleight of hand, but like somewhere in the proof, he did like something a little, really small thing that you wouldn't be able to catch. Or like an extra number or something. Yeah, or say. like some like you know, bed mass, like the order of operations. He probably did something in like an incorrect order of operations that changed up how it could work. Sir, if you're watching, you're wrong. <laughs> There's all these like small wow. little things that if you break one small yeah. rule you can like you can start to okay yeah wow so you did your undergrad your masters and now I'm doing a PhD all in maths in my undergrad I started in software engineering oh, and then okay. I switched to math and physics so I did a major in math and minor in physics oh because I, I liked quantum shit wow bro and and your masters I just did in math Okay, just and it's similar to what I'm doing now on my PhD. Okay, it's yeah. it's related to it, right? Yeah, it's yeah, it's actually one of the projects I'm working on now. It's still essentially the same project as when I did my masters. Wow, how do you have time, bro? I, this is the main question I wanted to ask you. I had only one question prepared yeah, for yeah, this, yeah, yeah. which is how do you do a PhD in maths? Actually, did a masters in maths, then a PhD in maths, and then you play spike ball like. at least maximum i would say 5 days a week or let's say say 4 4 days a yeah. week you play and every weekend you have some tournament almost maybe I, like 30 weekends you have I tournaments don't work that hard for my phd oh but you're doing it in maths yeah but uh, my supervisor is very smart he has good ideas and gets shit done and then i kind of sometimes have a good idea but i don't know you like i mean that's it i'm still doing my phd so I haven't done it yet. But honestly, I feel like so when I I just finished my one year in January or December, so I had to do like a one year review. And I felt like I haven't done that much. But like I don't have that much else going on in like terms of teaching commitments and stuff. So like I can spend most of my days from like I don't know 10 to 5 doing research. and even if i don't work that efficiently if i just have a couple of productive days here and there you get some stuff done okay and in math it's like it's weird cuz i'll spend some weeks where i get nothing done because i'm just stuck like i'm just not moving fast like today was very unproductive i don't have any ideas it's like yeah thank you coming to this podcast was unproductive <laughs> no <laughs> i think today was unproductive But then sometimes you're there and yeah. you have like a nice idea or you prove something and it just uh. like then it's quick if that makes sense and then I have to write it all up and that's what I'm doing right now is there's a lot of writing up I have to do which I hate. I think that like I mean one thing I'm lucky in my PhD I don't have too much teaching commitment and stuff. Like I know for the PhD students in Canada they were very overwhelmed because they had to do so much teaching, so much other stuff. There are parts of other like clubs and like stuff And I'm also not like pushing myself that hard in academia. Like I'm not trying to get as many papers published. I'm not trying to go to conferences. I'm not trying to give a lot of talks because I care more about having other ta- other having time for other stuff like just like while like hanging out with people like having a a balanced life. And I think that's actually one thing that I really love about Barcelona. Is if you look at the people who live in Barcelona, they know how to like not work too hard. They know how yeah. to really enjoy well, like they don't know they up. they try to they value their time. They value that. And I think that's something in like Canada and I mean even like an in Indian culture as well. Like growing up from my dad's side of family that everyone has to work so hard to like go to the top schools to do like the top stuff to finish like in the top percentage of whatever they're studying and whatever they're doing. Like everyone has this drive that they have to be their best. And like why like you be your best but you always then comparing yourself with someone who's doing more and someone who's doing more and you never actually had a level where you're like you've feel like you've accomplished much but like people here in Spain 
they're happy. They found a good job. It treats them well. It gives them enough money to live. They can go spend time, really enjoy their life and, life and stuff. And I think that's wonderful. And I think how I'm treating my PhD is like, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to continue on with my PhD to be honest, just because I think there's a lot of stuff in like academia and sh stuff that I'm not like a huge fan of. But I had the opportunity to do it in Barcelona and to stay in Barcelona and I love living in Barcelona and I do find math interesting and I do kind of enjoy the research. Definitely, but I don't think I want to like necessarily, it's not what I want to do for the rest of my life or it's not what I, but it's giving me the opportunity to live in Barcelona where I want to live right now. It gives me enough money to live off of. And I mean, at the end of the day, getting a PhD is not a bad thing. It will look good on my resume or for whatever I end up doing next. So I'm kind of got the mindset of like, okay, I'm here. Let me do the stuff, enjoy it. But I don't have to like, be amazing at it. I don't have to like be the best at it. I can just kind of do it to the level that works for me, you know? And that's kind of the mindset I have. And then I'm not stressed. Like I don't feel the stress that it has to be an amazing PhD. It just has to be something, you know? Yeah, that's what like whenever I yeah. see you and you say I'm working and then like two hours later you're back to the field or you're like outside going somewhere or you tell me you're going to some concert or you're just driving somewhere on some trip, which is like amazing you know with doing yeah. maths phd because doing a phd itself is insanely crazy and doing it in maths for me it sounds awesome you know even though you like the subject it's your yeah but strength. i actually think in some ways it's less work in math phd because it's really just like me and my supervisor it's a lot of individual work rather if i had to work in a lab or i had to work on like i don't know you're working with a lot of people and everyone is reliant on like your information and you always have a lot of like stuff you have to keep up with and do. For me, a day is just like me and scribbling shit in my notebook or like writing it up. It's like, mm. and I think in some ways that actually makes a math PhD less work than a lot of other PhDs. Okay. Also the writing is usually, you're not expected to like produce as big of a paper, as big of a stuff because it's very condensed, right? So like if you have results, you don't need like a huge, Thing to write up you don't need to write like a 200 page thesis on like why england fucked india for example <laughs> thanks <laughs> no but like i think that's fun you know i can yeah. I, I can write like 20 pages about that <laughs> no but and it's like yeah. but it's like you have what you have to write and there's like some there's not as much background there's not as much stuff that i feel like in some ways it might be more complicated at times but i don't think it's more time consuming than other phds you know. look you look chill, you look happy, you look satisfied. I think that is what is important. Yeah. You know, compared to anything else. Yeah, no, for you know. me too, and I think, yeah. Okay, and uh, do you think, like, Barcelona has made a big impact on you re regarding this? Like, if you got your yeah, PhD in another country? Yeah, I think it could be more, definitely more stressful. Um, I think, like, life in other countries is just more stressful in general. Uh -huh. I think... And then I also meant... I think, like, the sun is also... The sun. So nice to, like, stay calm. It just sounds stupid, but, like... <laughs> no, it's true. You know, it's when true. you finish work and you go outside and it's a sunny day and you just chill on the patio, have a drink, or just doing something, you know, the worries go away, man. Yeah, for sure. Because, like, worst case, you know, I just get some random job in Barcelona and just live and chill and... I don't know, like, less worries here, I just feel like. No, it's true. When I open yeah. the when I opened the door for you and when I was saying hello, I was like, yeah. God, why is it so cold? Why is it so dark? And why is it raining? Rain? And then people get like then yeah. there's not other stuff in their life, so people get too like focused and like zoning in on work and shit. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think Barcelona is fantastic for that. I think people here just seem very happy in general. Yeah, that's very true. Most people. A lot less people have depression and a lot less people have like yeah, compared to Canada, I think people in Vancouver, I think, are not in a good state mental health-wise. Like, I know a lot of friends in Vancouver who are, like, depressed or, like, are struggling with stuff. And I think a lot of it is, like, the culture. And, like, yeah, but that's a whole... Culture thing. meaning, like, like, it's not chill as Barcelona is what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, okay. just, like, the culture. It's also, I feel like Canada is a very isolating culture. There's a lot less, like, community, a lot less, like... People are together. There's a lot less like, yeah, I don't know. But There's so many Indians there, huh? 
In Canada? Yeah, it's like it's like mini India. I mean, man, Canada's got so many people from everywhere. Yeah, that's like, true. Like, so... Yeah. I have, like, very, very few friends whose grandparents are born in Canada. Okay. So, like, in... Yeah, and so, like, in Vancouver especially, because it's yeah. one of the newest parts of Canada, it's, like, all almost all immigrants. Like, in my math and physics classes, because they tend to have more Asian people, and the area I grew up with was quite, like, Asian, meaning more, like, Chinese, Korean, were the predominant two. But I would say maybe with a class of 25, there was, like, five non Chinese or Korean people in, like, my physics classes and my math classes. Oh, okay. And not many Indian people in the area I grew up. But then if you go out to other parts of Vancouver, like Surrey and stuff, it would be, like, the schools would be, like, 60% Indian. Okay. But then in where I grew up, it was, like, 60% Chinese. Maybe, yeah, I think where I grew up was mainly Chinese. So a lot of people from Hong Kong, a lot of people from China, I think maybe, like, 10% Korean, but I would say, like, 50% Chinese maybe 30% white, and then 10% other. Okay. Hey, that's really yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't know this this part about um, Canada, that mm-hmm. French is your second language. Like, yeah. of the, the country's official second language it's is French, French right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've heard in Quebec, uh, Quebec is the state? Yeah, or Q- the, province. It's the province. Yeah, same thing. Which is like a state. Yeah. Kind of. It's okay. a state. It's just a different word for it. Yeah. Okay. There you guys have French. Uh, Everything's French. Everything it's is French. It's kind of like Catalan in a way, Cat- Catalonia in a way. Yeah. Where like the schools are all done in French. If if your parents were English, and you speak English at home, you have to go to a French speaking school. It's a rule. Yeah, it's a law. Okay. Um, if your parents speak French and you speak French at home, then they allow you to go to an English school. Because the reasoning is that you already, you're going to know French. But they want everyone to know French as, like, their main language or as an equivalent to a first language. But then if somebody from another country, like from India, comes... Their kids would have to go to a French. French, because they already know a bit of English. But I think that Quebec actually has the least amount of immigrants of anywhere in Canada, I would say. And I think that's probably a reason why. Immigrants tend to want to go to usually the main places. I mean, obviously, everywhere is different. And there's also... Immigrants from different countries feel more um, at home in different places. Like if you if they're coming from a French speaking part of the world, they probably want to go to Quebec. But I think the majority of immigrants usually either go to Ontario, like Toronto area, or Vancouver, and then also like the other major cities like Calgary and Edmonton and stuff too. But is using the word immigrant very uh like predominant in Canada, like you say there are immigrants from India, there are immigrants from China. Is that word very used widely to them, even though they have Canadian passports and stuff like that? Is that a common thing to use? So in they wouldn't be considered immigrant. I mean, like... Like, because how would you know? Not you, I'm just saying in general, how would you know that they're not Canadian? So usually they're if, they're Canadian? Like, if they're born in Canada, mm-hmm. you wouldn't say they're immigrants. When you say immigrants, you mean people who have moved over here in the last 10, 15 years. Okay. But a lot of Indian and Asians, I wouldn't really consider immigrants anymore. They're just Canadians. Okay. Um, but I mean, at some point at first, they would have been. Yeah, because they're coming from their Canada. home country. Yeah. But I mean, everyone in Canada was immigrants. So it's like Canada's within under 200 years. But is that, is that like a joke within you guys? Do you guys have that? Like, like, no one is Cana- like Canadian, Canadian. No, because there are racist white people who think that they're Canadian, Canadian. But where are they actually from? Like, actually, actually from, like, yeah, their grandparents? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're under, like, I think maybe in Eastern Canada, there's some people who moved here, like, 400 years ago or something. Oh, okay. But for the most part, almost, that's, like, very rare. Um, but a mixture of everything, mainly from Europe. So the first immigrants were from Europe. So it was France took over Quebec, and then England took over the rest of Canada. So, I mean, in Quebec, you would have most immigrants who were coming from France. And then in the other parts of Canada, kind of, it, it also depends on the region, but you get a lot of English, obviously. Irish, you get a lot. There's some parts of Ontario where you have a lot of Scandinavians. Oh, okay. Yeah. Apparently, they were very racist. Oh, the Scandinavians? <laughs> Towards the Aboriginal people. Okay. I mean, everyone was racist towards the Aboriginal people. Okay. Though, and that's like... So the Aboriginal people would be the only true Canadians. But 
Yeah, but like I, I think in general, like as a nation, Canada is quite good to immigrants. Compare, I mean, obviously there are cases that are not, but compared to many other countries, I would say so. And I mean, they let my family in when my family needed to enter. So for that, I like you know I'm grateful. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> when my dad needed a place to go, but okay. But it's not like I mean, it's not a straight from forward country. It's was open to immigrants and it's like the way it is because it's still the land. Okay. What is this uh, USA and Canada joke going on? Like there's always like the people from US make fun of Canada. I've seen it on shows but I don't I don't get the joke. It's like more I don't just laugh. like I don't know. It's not like too big of anything but, but it's Canada's on every just, TV like, show. A little brother of like the states in a way. Mm. Like because, like, I mean, Canada and the States are very similar, yet very different. Um, but, yeah, so, like, it's just an easy joke to make, to make a joke about Canadians, because it's, like, because we're similar to the States, but we're, like, not, so you can make fun of us because it's not racist, but it's, like, still kind of funny. But there's not, like... There's not, like, a real rivalry between the states. It's, like, a fun yeah. something for Jolly or something. And, I mean, like, the states are bigger and, like, a much larger culture and, and stuff. But Canada's, like, better in many ways. So, like, no one is, like, upset. Like, I don't take it seriously when the states make fun of Canada because, like, who the f*** would want to be the states, you know? And I don't think... <laughs> <laughs> we put it that way, yeah. <laughs> and I don't think the states get mad when we make fun of the states because, like, look at the f- <laughs> they're a shit show. <laughs> like they either know they're a shit show, uh. or they're like those "Make America Great Again" people, and then they just don't know anyone from different countries <laughs> from Canada. So then they just only consume the states part, and they don't even think about Canada. Like I think most people, like the people who are really like proud Americans, just don't think about Canada. They just look at us like a little brother, and then the people who like know more about Canada. Know that the states is shit, so they're not. <laughs> I have a question for you. Can you uh, tell the difference between somebody from the states and somebody from Canada? No, I can't. Because there's so many people. Yeah. Uh, like you said, immigrants. Yeah. Like from three, four, ge- from three, four generations. Yeah. And uh, it's very hard to say. Maybe with the accent. Maybe with the. But what U- about in terms of like um, just personality type? Do you notice difference? Because you've met a lot of people who speak well from a lot of people from the states, less people probably from Canada, but some. But can you tell the difference in personality type between the two? I really can't. Okay. But then I would know that this person is giving me more U.S. vibes. But so you can't tell if someone's giving you more U.S. vibes. U.S. vibes, I can say. Canada okay. vibes, I can't say. If like for me, uh, I don't know, Canada, yeah, the first person. For me is uh, Justin Trudeau. No, kidding. It's you. <laughs> no, for me, it's you. So then if someone has a similar, not personality, but then, you know, you have that very wavy, wildly, like that wilderness vibe you give me. <laughs> yeah, you give me that vibe. But then the, it's, there's nothing wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. you get it. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Kind of. Yeah, like you give me that very free, you know, like open. I don't know. Wild. Uh, I don't know. What? <laughs> fair, fair, fair. <laughs> But yeah. a different vibe. I just want yeah. to acknowledge there's a different vibe. Oh, no, 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 complete, states. no okay, completely okay. different. So somebody from US, I think I can try to say with the accent, I can yeah. try. And maybe just the way they talk, I feel this is being uh, very uh, judgmental, I would say. But most of the people who I've interacted with, maybe that's just like 10 or something. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting a little of a bit of show off vibes from them definitely the like, states people are more like arrogant and in your face yeah but then not about me not about no no but just in general just about yeah. the, states, the states or about what they are doing what they're doing when a state a person from the states talk about what they're doing they're it's like, like wow it's so cool it's the yeah, biggest thing in the world but it's exactly. like exactly hey it's not because the states is like yeah. grown up with this mindset that they're the center of the world you know mm-hmm. And everything revolves around the states. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Which is kind of true. <laughs> They're not wrong. <laughs> it is. Like, all Canadian culture comes from yeah. the states. How's the rounded community, bro? I want to say, like, that's how we met. Yeah. Yeah. So, how's, how's that been with you for the last two, two and a half years? I mean, for you, I think much more, no? Three years. 
I think. I you... mean, when did I move to Barcelona? It's been two and a half years now. Two and a half. To Barcelona. Yeah, fantastic. And then and then we play together in the in the World Cup. That's uh, that's the dream. Team that's India. a dream. Team India. <laughs> so, is there a level of infinity in between those two? So you have the natural numbers and you have the irrational numbers. Is there something that's in between that? I mean, so so essentially you have like the Aboriginal people. So um, the people who were like native to Canada before Columbus and before like Canada got settled or colonized by the European nations. Um, and then from there, they have many different like tribes and regions and whatnot. But um, 